Let me warmly welcome everybody, first of all, both through Zoom and here in person for our today's distinguished seminar as part of the Texas and m Energy Institute lecture series. It gives me great pleasure, both on a professional and a personal level, to, to welcome Professor Venkat, Venkata Subramanian, a close colleague for over 30 years now, and counting, oh my God, <laughs> and, uh, and, and the person who I really respect and honor is my friend, you know, so Venkat, why doesn't this move? Okay, so a little bit of background, so for Professor Venkat's distinguished career, he did his undergraduate degree at the University of Madras in chemical engineering. And then he had a, a, a very exclusive career coming to entering the process systems area in chemical engineering. First of all, receiving a master in physics from Vanderbilt University, and then doing a PhD in chemical engineering at Cornell, but on thermodynamics with Professor Keith Gubb, right? So he had, and that's why in a lot of his work, he brings this thermodynamic insights in process systems engineering and beyond, right? You know, so now, and then he moved his first, he started his career, his career from Columbia. Then he moved to Purdue where he was very well known for many years there, established himself as a powerhouse in process systems engineering. And then moved back to, to Columbia University now since 2016. It sounds like yesterday, by the sort of, And uh, where he's, uh, uh, of course, uh, now the Samuel Ruben Peter Biller, uh, professor of engineering at the Department of Chemical Engineering, and he's affiliated with industrial engineering and computer science. He, let me first start with his academic tree, is very interesting because. You know, there is young Velkat receiving his PhD. This is Professor Keith Cabins, and you can see the importance of that academic tree. But he's also indirectly associated with the famous Sargent tree because his undergraduate thesis supervisor was actually the third PhD student of Professor Sargent, right? You know, so you can see, and you know, uh, most of you are part of the Sargent tree, so we are, it's a well celebrated tree in chemical engineering. I would like to acknowledge the impact of Professor Benkat on the research sphere. He has done, apart from what he's going to present us, his insights on the evolution and impact of AI as we move forward, where he was one of the pioneers, not now, but 30 years ago, you know, when. You know, so he's done a lot of work on understanding phenomena in self-organized complex dynamical systems. He's, he's done similar work, so system, understanding systemic risk, for example. And he's done a lot on uh, in systemic failures, but a lot of material discovery that is linked to the, the work that he's going to present to us uh, earlier today. And, you know, he has brought his flair also. He has written this book how much inequality is fair, right? I mean, addressing from a scientific basis, from principles even of thermodynamics and beyond, an analysis of an a open financial with societal question, right? You know, is inequality inherent in, you know, in uh, societal systems? And how much is fair, how much is unfair? It's a very important thing. So, no wonder he got a number of awards. Obviously, the flagship computing and chemical engineering award that he received in 2009. He, he gave the Sargent lecture at Imperial College. He has a couple of his papers, perhaps the most well cited papers in the flagship, uh, generally the field computer chemical engineering, where we uh, served for many years, now the editor in chief, but we have been uh, together in partners in SIL for many years. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
and has received the numerous other awards. So without further ado, let us all warmly welcome Professor the Howdy Way, the Texas uh, and then way, the Aggies way. Let's welcome Professor Verkat, Verkat Subramanian. Sweet, please. Yep. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stratos, for that very kind and generous uh, introduction, and also for the invitation uh, to give us a lecture. Uh, I've, uh, I've already been welcomed in the uh, Texan uh, way uh, when Corey picked, um, picked me up in a pickup truck. So Corey and Yusuf were kind enough to pick me up this morning, and uh, this was the first time I remarked that I had been picked up in a pickup truck. <laughs> and I took it up. You know, you know, they asked me whether this was my first time in Texas A&M. You know, I said, no, I was here maybe 10 years ago when Sam Mellon was here and uh, I came for one of the uh, O'Connor Safety Center events. Uh, but it was the first time I was picked up in a big of truck. Uh, so I already have received the Texan book. But thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here in person and uh, uh, as as uh, started as my recall, I was supposed to uh, give this uh, lecture in two, year. two, two years ago, yeah. 2020, yeah. around the same time. Exactly. Yeah. And then that got postponed. So I'm, I'm delighted that it's finally uh, here. So uh, my talk is, um, it's fairly um, a broad uh, uh, kind of a perspective on artificial intelligence, uh, particularly uh, AI and chemical engineering. And, and um, what I hope to give you is a flavor of uh, uh, where we have been in the past, what's happening now, and where we could be going in the future. Now, with all the excitement about AI, uh, it, you know, many people think it's a fairly new field uh, with this business of self-driving cars and uh, whatnot. But you might be surprised to know that it's really not all that new. Uh, certainly, artificial intelligence and chemical engineering is not all that new. Um, there's really a 35 year old literature there, more than, by my estimate, more than 3,000 papers, not general AI papers. General AI papers in the last 35 years that I probably approaches half a million or more. This is AI applied to chemical engineering problems. And uh, that is, uh, there's quite a bit there already. And so, what I plan to do today is to give you a sense of uh, uh, highlights of uh, what kind of things uh, people have uh, looked at in the last three decades, identify the current uh, challenges and opportunities. And in there, I would particularly uh, emphasize the conceptual uh, uh, challenges more than the implementation and, and organization, even though those things are important, but as academics, it is the concepts where we really can have a huge uh, impact. It's a broad overview. I won't get into all the technical details, uh, but as uh, Stratos referred to, um, uh, the details, uh, you can pick them up in this uh, perspective article that published three years ago. So what is AI? So let's start with a quick uh, definition of AI. Uh, this is the one I, of the many, you know, many definitions out there. This is the one I've always liked and used for the last 40 years. AI is the study of how to make computers do things at which at the moment people are better. So it's actually a fairly simple, but yet a far reaching definition written by, defined by Elaine Rich, uh, who was actually a faculty member in Texas Austin for many years uh, in computer science. Uh, and she wrote one of the early textbooks in AI, uh, in, uh, published in 1983. So in that she doesn't say what things, the implication is then everything. Okay, that includes not just you know, robotic manipulation or driving cars or computer vision systems, but composing music, composing poetry, drawing, you know, paintings, 
all the things that we take for granted as great human endeavors, the implication here is that computers will be able to do those things also. Not only that, we may be good at those things, but computers will surpass us in all those things as well. Now, Rupert, this definition was conceived in the early 80s, but this seemed like a bit of a stretch, you know. But we have seen in the last 40 years, you know, we, you know, the things uh, such as, you know, human champions in chess, you know, they lost to Gary Kasparov, lost to uh, Deep Talk in uh, uh, late night, I think 1999 in the New York City Games, uh, the championship. And then four years ago, Lisa Gall lost the Go championship to AlphaGo. So now, 40 years later, this doesn't look like such a far uh, cry. And, and then the computers are going to overtake us and everything that we are, we think we've been very good at. So this is known as the central dogma of AI. This is the general belief. The belief is there's nothing special about the human brain uh, that, that cannot be uh, re replicated in a computer. And so that's the central dogma. Now, I classify uh, AI work in chemical engineering in four phases. The first one is what I call as the expert systems uh, era or the era of symbolic AI. And, and the time period is roughly from the early 80s through 2000. So this is when people uh, created uh, computer programs uh, which mimicked human expert uh, reasoning, such as uh, a physician, for example, diagnosing uh, uh, an infectious uh, disease. And um, so uh, this was built on, uh, you know, research that was done in the 70s in, in cognitive science and metabolic psychology. Um, and that led to uh, the creation of this kind of an approach where the key ideas were the separation of the domain knowledge, such as say medical knowledge from the inference, which is how you manipulate it to reach conclusions and the flexible execution of uh, the program uh, and then representing knowledge in the form of if-then rules or production rules, as well as you know taxonomic knowledge represented in, in the form of networks called semantic uh, networks. So this, all these things get, led to the uh, you know first expert system in medicine created in in the seventies, um, and that's called Mycin. It's an expert system for diagnosing infectious diseases uh, through the work of. Uh, Stanford uh, computer scientists, as well as Stanford uh, medical school physicians. It took about 10 years and several million dollars of uh, DARPA funding, at the end of which it knew more than the six different doctors who were consulted uh, in developing this. And it successfully diagnosed all kinds of infectious diseases. And I read somewhere that it even passed the, qualifier, uh, the California certification exam. So it was qualified to practice medicine in the state of California. And this was in the uh, you know, late 70s and early 80s. Okay. And of course, this got a whole bunch of us excited in chemical engineering uh, in the early 80s. Uh, and uh, you know, Art Westover at uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, did, uh, with, with his uh, PhD student, Rene Benyaris, a kind of a close friend of ours, who was actually a colleague of um, Stratosis and uh, Rene teaches at Oxford now. So he developed the very first expert system in chemical engineering called Confide for predicting thermodynamic property prediction. And that paper appeared in Computers and Chemical Engineering in 1983. And that's why I timed this era as starting around 1983. And this was Rene's master's thesis. Then for his PhD, he did an expert system for catalyst design, that's decade. Around the same time, I was setting up my AI lab at Columbia. Uh, looking at model-based approaches to fault diagnosis in uh, chemical systems. Same time, George Stephanopoulos was setting up his AI lab at MIT to look at uh, design, and also Jim Davis uh, at uh, Ohio State. The first course on AI was developed and taught at Columbia in 1986, and I taught that for three years, and then when I moved to Purdue, I continued to teach it there at Purdue, and now I'm back at Columbia teaching the same course. In fact, um, it, it will be, we are, uh, it's, it's a fall offering. Last fall, I taught uh, that course. So, so that course has been going on for now almost uh, you know, 36 uh, years or so. Uh, first conference on AI in chemical engineering was also held at Columbia in 1987. So let me give you a couple of highlights from that expert systems era. This was uh, a project uh, called the Abnormal Situation Management Project, ASM, uh, 
project uh, headed by Honeywell and with participation from all the major oil companies. At that time, Exxon and Mobil were two separate companies. And so this was a program that was funded uh, at the tune of about $17 million. Half of it came from the US government, uh, from NIST, and the other half came from these participating agencies. And the goal was to do a <laughs> next generation control system, intelligent control system, where when the alarms go off, when things go wrong in a chemical plant and the alarms go off, we depend on human operators to figure out what went wrong and what to do about it. Now, we were, the goal was to develop an AI program which will recognize uh, the deviation, do the diagnosis, just like the medical system did the medical diagnosis. Now, this time, now the plant is the patient. And, and then the high temperature alarm goes off, you figure out what went wrong, and then either you take the control action in close loop or at least provide the advice to the operator. And so that was the goal to develop uh, intelligent control systems. And there were three universities uh, invited to participate, uh, Jim Davis at Ohio State uh, at the time, and then uh, my group at Purdue at the time, and then Kim Vincent from uh, Toronto. And this is actually the forerunner to the smart manufacturing initiative, which uh, got funded in uh, 2016. So as part of this, we developed, uh, again, our work uh, has been not developing AI based black box models, but models where we can put in first principles as much as we knew. So we uh, develop causal models, multi-scale causal models approach so that you can do the reasoning and also do the explanation later on, interpret the decisions that the expert system or, or the AI program makes. So from the plant level, you can focus on onto a particular unit, uh, you know, subsystem and then to the unit and then develop uh, diagraph models for capturing the cause and effect uh, uh, relationships. And then uh, for procedures, uh, for startup and start, shut down kind of problems or in pharmaceutical companies where pr the procedures carry a lot of information. For example, this is uh, based on some work we did for Pfizer. Uh, there is um, a, a process where you have a reaction filtration drying, and then the reaction itself involves several steps and so these are all captured in the form of, uh, represented in the form of petri nets. And then each one of those have the several variables associated with them and their cause and effect uh, different things. So, so this work was done and these kind of things went into this uh, intelligent control system that we developed as part of the ASM program for Honeywell called a DKIT or Diagnostic Toolkit which is sort of like a panel of physicians looking at a chemical plant. So you have the diagrams, observers, trend analysis, expert rules, neural nets. These were all different experts looking at the same data coming in real time from the plant and making an assessment, assessment about the status and, and what to do about it. And then uh, when they all make different recommendations, there is a conflict resolution model where they build a consensus about what, what uh, needs to be done. So as part of this, for example, when suddenly the trend goes abnormal like this, the trend analysis would recognize these signatures and then make an appropriate uh, uh, recommendation. And so this was implemented in an expert system environment called G2. Um, you know, um, and then it was tested uh, for, at the Exxon uh, refinery in uh, Baden Rouge. Now, DK successfully diagnosed failures even before the alarms went off because the alarms don't, you know, uh, you know, there is a threshold. Only after that, you know, you, you know, you uh, uh, you alert the operator. But as the trend begins uh, begins to deviate, uh, DK is what able to recognize that. And then, um, uh, typically, you you know, about half an hour to two hours before the alarms went off, it was able to inform the operator, look, there's something wrong. This is what is going on. These are your uh, possible suspects, and these are your options. And so. You know, since it did so well, uh, everyone got excited. And so Honeywell licensed DKIT from Purdue in 1998. This was the first program licensed by um, a control company uh, to develop uh, AI-based uh, uh, control system. And uh, so why haven't we heard about DKIT after that? Well, it turned out it's one thing to do all these things as a research prototype but to then scale and apply it and widely deploy it everywhere. Uh, that, that is where the implementation and organizational problems come in. And those were 
uh, turned out to be uh, pretty, pretty uh, uh, major difficulties in, in those years. Looking back, I think we were about 20 to 30 years too early to attack uh, this problem using AI um, from, from an industrial impact point of view. We, even though we showed how this could be done, what the knowledge representation needs to be, how the search needs to be done, how knowledge needs to be organized, how do you do the training, validation, and all that. Uh, but for industrial impact, uh, we were just too uh, early. Let me now switch gears and talk about a different kind of problems. Now, this is about design. This is designing materials. And uh, so essentially in design, you have to solve two problems. One is given a product structure, such as a chemical uh, structure or formulation, you need to predict macroscopic properties. For example, if these are polymer structures, what about the glass transition temperature, coefficient of thermal expansion and all that. The design problem is the inverse problem. Often we know what property we want, but it is the inverse problem. Um, So inverse problem is you know what you want, but you don't know what structure or formulation will get you there. So we showed that by using Yeah. yeah, sounds good. So, so we showed that uh, we can do the forward problem using hybrid neural networks, where we put in whatever first principles knowledge we know in the system, and then uh, such as the basics of the uh, you know physics and chemistry that we are comfortable you know, that we know for sure, um, uh, and then fill in the gap using the uh, uh, neural network. For example, you know you don't want. I don't want the neural network to come back and tell me, guess what? Mass balance is conserved. I know that already. So things of that sort, I already put it in. And then, and that also reduces the amount of data you need because now the network doesn't have to do all, all those things. And the inverse problem, we use a genetic algorithm where um, we, again, there we put in whatever structures, uh, 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 you know, that makes sense. Uh, and, and so we can put in all the chemistry constraints the valence constraints and so on. So basically it's di directed evolution in uh, silico. And, and we did this to design fuel additives for lubrizol and rubber compounds for uh, caterpillar. Now this idea of directed evolution turns out to be very important uh, because uh, Francis Arnold at Caltech independently developed this same technique. But in vitro, she was designing enzymes when we were designing polymers and fuel additives and rubber compounds. And it turns out it's an important idea, not because I say so, the Nobel Committee said so. Uh, she was awarded the Nobel Prize for the Directed Evolution uh, work in chemistry. Now, uh, around the same time, we also designed uh, this uh, intelligent system for uh, catalyst development for ExxonMobil, where given the data and also your uh, initial understanding of the underlying chemistry, it automatically converted that into an internal representation, which we call as reaction description language. From that, it automatically generated all the algebraic and differential equations, then solved it, and then inferred the parameters and so on. So the novel features in this work was, we developed uh, the first uh, domain specific la language for uh, uh, reaction chemistry related knowledge. It also, we also developed uh, domain specific compilers, uh, uh, chemistry ontology was built, and, uh, and, and we discovered an, an approach uh, which people now call as active uh, learning. So, uh, and then moving on to safety applications, uh, around that time uh, at Purdue, we developed a, a system where you can draw the flow sheet and it automatically generated all the things that can potentially go wrong. Uh, uh, and so that you can actually use this tool during the design stage and avoid uh, dangerous uh, designs, um, such as, for example, what went, one of the design flaws in the Bhopal disaster was uh, making a lot of metal isocyanate and storing, uh, you know, tons of it on, on facility. After the accident, we realized that there were there were other design uh, options where you didn't keep so much 
uh, and so on. So things of that sort uh, could be uh, uh, avoided. So this is process hazards analysis using artificial intelligence. And this was tested on real life case studies, both continuous and batch processes, such as pharmaceuticals. And typically it captured about 95 to 100% of human team, uh, you know, or human experts uh, uh, conclusions and results in about half the time and, and half the money. So it had about uh, half a million lines of code uh, um, and, and, and then it's the work of several PhD uh, students uh, uh, over a decade or so. So now that is what was the expert system era was like roughly from the early 80s to late 90s. Now, the second era, second phase started with the discovery of uh, uh, rediscovery of the back algorithm and neural networks. The problems with the expert systems were it just took too much time and effort and specialized expertise uh, to do it. And so it did not scale well for industrial applications. Whereas the back algorithm, uh, which was rediscovered, was actually Paul Verbos's work at, uh, 10 years before. Uh, at, at, at was Harvard PhD thesis, uh, but uh, Hinton and company at Carnegie Mellon rediscovered it 10 years later, and this completely changed the game, where now you can train, uh, they discover the input-output uh, patterns uh, using neural networks automatically, so you don't have to be putting in the knowledge like we did in the expert system, it automatically discovered it, so uh, that, that made it a lot, lot easier. Not only that, people were able to show that uh, it did nonlinear function approximation well and nonlinear classification well. So this led to a whole bunch of papers in process control and diagnosis um, um, from that uh, period onwards. So in roughly the first 30 years, there was a lot of progress in AI and chemical engineering. You know, people showed uh, uh, you know, success stories and monitoring and diagnosis, control, design, synthesis, safety analysis. I didn't go much into optimization or planning and scheduling. There was a lot of work there and materials uh, design prototypes were demonstrated. Even some industrial applications uh, were fielded. So if all those things happened, how come, you know, we didn't hear about any of these things, you know, and, uh, and all the excitement that we hear now about AI, okay? Well, largely because it, they didn't scale well. So when you took them, these were all research prototype demonstrations. When you tried to get them to, except for a few exceptions here and there for industrial applications, the implementational and organizational challenges were just too difficult, uh, too much to surmount. And that was because, mainly because of lack of computational power and computational uh, storage. Uh, there was no internet in the early years. Um, uh, 1995 is typically when people say internet, uh, you know, uh, arrived, uh, and, and then so there was no uh, uh, communication infrastructure. And my students were programming in Lisp. You know, this is the archaic AI language. Only people with some gray hair can would know. Now, you know, so this is long long before you know uh, Python libraries and uh, you know Jupyter notebooks and so on. So. Uh, you know, it's like pulling teeth uh, to write uh, AI programs and so they, uh, you know, a few years ago, we replicated some of the work uh, we did on uh, uh, directed evolution. And I literally wept when I saw that what my student took a year to implement in list. And then it took uh, weeks to debug and days to run. Uh, uh, this undergrad from uh, <laughs> Columbia Computer Science uh, essentially created the program in one day and it ran. <laughs> and I said to myself, you know, uh, I called my student who was, who was still in New York and said, you know, you know, King Chan was his name. I said, King, you know what happened today? So, you know, that, that was AI then. And lack of data, and then also there was a lot of it. So as a result, basically, it was just too difficult to do AI uh, in, in those uh, uh, days. And like I said, we were, I didn't realize that. I knew I was about 10 years early, but I didn't realize I was about 30 years early attacking uh, these problems. Okay, so what is different? So why am I so excited about AI now? So in 85, when I got started at Columbia as an assistant professor, the biggest, baddest computer we all wanted to get our hands on was this beast called Cray 2. It was a supercomputer, 
Uh, and, um, you know, it took up enormous amount of space, you know, probably needed typically, you know, one half or one third of this floor. Uh, and, and you can see the scale, you know, people standing there, this is great too. And with all the other, uh, you know, associated accessories. Um, it, 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 you know, it, it, it put out so much heat because it consumed 150 kilowatts of power. And it required a huge cooling system to keep it uh, going. And that's why you needed all this. Most of this thing is actually a cooling system. I used to joke that Cray was really a space heater, which did computing on the side. <laughs> and it cost a pretty penny, you know, $32 million in today's dollars, and, you know, and half of that in uh, 1985 dollars. So what would Cray look like today? Okay, so this is Cray in 1985. So let me show you Cray, my <laughs> Apple Watch. Okay, in fact, this, this Apple, this is the old version, this is the most uh, recent version. Apple Watch is more powerful than Cray on all those metrics. Not only that, it consumes just one watt of power and roughly, you know, 300, 400 dollars. This is a game changer. Now, in 1985, if somebody had walked up to me and said to me, Venkat, you want a Cray, right? I want access to Cray. Let me promise you this. You will not only have access to a Cray, you will actually own it and that it will be on your wrist. <laughs> that guy would have been admitted into the lunatic asylum the same way. <laughs> Nobody saw this coming. Nobody saw this coming. This is the 150,000 X gain. For basically, for one dollar of computing, you are getting 150,000 more uh, you know, impact now than we did at the time. So, how did this happen? Well, this all happened because of one thing. Really, really one thing, which is Moore's law. Gordon Moore, one of the co-founders of Intel, made the prediction in the 1960s that computers would double in their power every 18 months for the same footprint or the same cost. And he said this may go on for 10 years, maybe 20 years. Even Moore did not expect that this would actually go on for 50 years. This kind of compounding, we basically got lucky with Moore's law. And also, the, to the credit of the hardware designers, the engineers got created. So it's because of Moore's law in this log log plot, you have the straight line, you know, where you go from these, uh, you know, IBM 80 kind of machines we all started out with, and then with uh, Apple Watch, a gray on the wrist. And it all happens because of Moore's law. And because of Moore's law, we have all this fantastic computational power, cheap computational storage, internet arrived, all these. Easy to use uh, software environments arrive, specialized graphics uh, processors like the NVIDIA GPUs and all that. And uh, so we have Google, Dell, all those things. Every single thing can be traced back to Moore's law. Basically, it's become easier and cheaper to do AI based solutions. So, with that, we entered data science. This is the new era, roughly from 2005 onwards. And this is the third phase in my four phase, uh, you know, classification. And where, you know, we have the new idea here is hierarchical feature extraction. And, and the three important ideas are deep neural nets, reinforcement learning and statistical machine learning. Again, these are not new ideas. They are important ideas, but really, they are not really new as you'll see in the next slide. So what is really new or data, GPU, and software in that order of importance. We have a lot more data available now, and we have very powerful GPUs to you know, uh, analyze the data and easy to develop a uh, software environment. And that is why we have Watson and Siri and Alexa, AlphaGo, and everything else. So going forward, I just want to remind you of the hype cycle. You know, there's so much excitement. People are making all kinds of promises about AI. I warn about those in my perspectives. I've already lived through two of those hype cycles. I remember all the hype that was associated with expert systems in the 80s. Uh, that was our Carnegie Mellon days. And then the neural nets in the 90s. And now I see similar things. And there is value there, but that we need to be careful about what we can do and what we cannot do yet. Okay. First of all, there's a lot of the things that people present as new are really old ideas, uh, some from 20, 30 years back. Okay, for example, the self-driving car, that was actually demonstrated for the first time in July, 1995, roughly 25 years, you know, 27 years ago, when this minivan drove itself from Pittsburgh to San Diego 
most of the time, except for city traffic, traffic of 50 miles. So self-driving car is not all that new. It was demonstrated, you know, 27 years ago. Uh, this was called the Look Ma No Hands Project. I can't even know <laughs> See, we always came up with cute names for all their work. And this was my defense department funded uh, project. Uh, what is new now about the self-driving car is you don't need millions of dollars to create that uh, hardware and software system. It probably costs a few thousand dollars, that's all. And also it doesn't take up an entire, they used a minivan because it needed, all the computers were bulky. The radar systems were bulky. So they got rid of all the seats, two seats in the front and then everything else was computing. Now you can put all that system, you know, in the size of a briefcase in a Volkswagen bug. Okay, so the idea is nothing new. It was even demonstrated. And call, the deep neural net, so the original paper was published in 1990. Auto encoder network, the first paper appeared in 1991. Not only that, it was published by a chemical engineer, our good friend Mark Kramer from MIT, and it appeared in a chemical engineering journal, AICHE journal. It, it, I think it is one of the most highly cited papers in the history of AICHE journal. Uh, and and it, is, it had the auto encoder idea. So people were thinking about a lot of things that people are thinking about now, even then, we simply didn't have the hardware and software uh, to do that. Inverse design of materials that everybody is excited about now was demonstrated in the early 90s, causal models, explainable AI, and so on. So for the young folks, it's really worth reading the old papers. There are some really cool ideas uh, uh, in there. Okay. The other thing is that for many problems in chemical engineering, we really don't need reinforcement learning, deep neural nets, and so on. Simpler AI techniques. And then, uh, you know, knowing what the underlying physics and chemistry or biology is and putting those things in, uh, that is uh, uh, more important. So, um, uh, so the thing is, how do you put prior knowledge into our systems is, is one of the uh, outstanding uh, challenges there. So the other complaint I have is that, you know, a self-driving car may do a great job driving through say New York City, probably do better than most New York drivers, including myself, but does it understand the fundamental knowledge behind mechanics, such as Newton's laws, S equals me, the concept of momentum and acceleration and, 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 and force as we do, okay? So in my mind, it's behavior is like, you know, what you see in this National Geographic videos where, you know, this, you know, the cheetah is chasing a gazelle. Both animals display a tremendous mastery of the dynamics of the chase. But both are true about the underlying physics, which is classical mechanics, or the underlying math, which is calculus. In my mind, current robotic systems are more like animal-like mastery. They have achieved the animal-like mastery, but they don't have the deeper uh, understanding of these things. And that, to me, very, is very troubling as a scientist. You know, it, it is just not acceptable to me that, that we can rely on only black box models which have this kind of animal like mastery without a deeper understanding of the first principles. So our work has been, how do you actually put that thing in? Now, I'm also worried about it as an engineer because, you know, uh, you know knowing what goes on matters in certain safety critical applications like diagnosis, control and safety to build credibility uh, because the cost of a mistake in certain domains like in chemical engineering, nuclear engineering and aerospace engineering can be potentially very high. In that sense, it's very different from a bad recommendation you may get from Yelp. So you go to a restaurant, you don't like the food, you probably lost a couple of hundred dollars, maybe a couple of hours, but and hopefully nobody died. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Otherwise, the Yelp rating was really bad. <laughs> but, uh, but that's not the case if a reactor explodes. It kills people. So the cost of a mistake is potentially very high in, in chemical engineering. And so, so as a result, it is just not acceptable to me to use only black box uh, models, which may be okay for recommendation systems like Yelp and Rotten Tomatoes, and maybe Tinder, you know, you know, <laughs> you know have a bad date recommendation, but um, as, you know, as long as uh, not an axe murder or something, <laughs> you know, you get all way over it so much. So I classify the opportunity <coughs> into three classes of problems. The easy problems are those where there's lots of data available, there's easy to use machine learning tools available on the internet. And to me, it's they're not particularly interesting as research problems because many, you know, we demonstrated these kinds of things 25 years ago. 
And so they are not terribly exciting. Uh, they're useful to do, and it's that's why people in the industry are doing it. It's already happening. Okay, these are various examples of those applications. The hard problems are how do you build hybrid AI models? How do you put first principles and data driven techniques together? How do you build physics and chemistry into our models? How do you build causal models so that you can explain mechanistically what the problem? And again, these things were also demonstrated 20, 30 years ago, but there are a lot more opportunities here because there's still much more need to be done. Basically, how do you combine how symbolic AI, which is the AI of the expert systems, and the numeric AI, which is the machine learning today? I think this will take another 10 years or so to do them well because people are underestimating the difficulties in building hybrid AI models. The harder still are building this Watson-like systems for materials design or intelligent control. Remember the ASM project? We still don't have that system, that uh, system which we envisioned in 1995. Roughly 30 years later, we still don't have it because it really it is a hard problem. So that requires building ontologies, languages, and compilers. So I think this might take another 50 years. So this is where I think the researchers should focus on. These are the conceptual challenges that I, I, I mentioned at the okay. Now I'm gonna to switch to an entirely, uh, I'm, I'm gonna go really nuts now, okay. <laughs> and so talk about uh, phase four. This is AI, in a, I view this in a different way. This is self-organizing self intelligent system. Okay. Now, to me, this is the most intellectually exciting and challenging uh, problem out there, which is what is the fundamental science of self-organizing uh, intelligent uh, systems? Uh, in other words, you know, um, how do you model, predict, and control the behavior of very large population of intelligent agents, such as drone swarms, robots, self-assembling nanostructures, neurons, and, and, and whatnot? And another way of looking at this is, how do you do design control and optimization through self-organization? Okay, this is really a systems engineering problem. You know, and basically this is how biology designed all of us. All of us are products of design control or optimization through self-organization. Okay, so what is the fundamental science of that? So this is the brand new science of emergence, and there are grand conceptual challenges uh, here. So if you look at the 20th century science. It was largely reductionist in its perspective. We went from macroscopic matter to you know, atoms and nuclei, to protons and neutrons, and then quarks, and maybe even strings. So we went deeper and deeper and deeper, down and down and down, and discovering new and uh, you know, exciting uh, physics and chemistry and biology about our universe. Quantum mechanics and elementary particle physics came about this way. Even molecular biology was phenomenally successful going down this uh, route with the discovery of double helix and, uh, and how its impact on territory structures and so on. And by my estimate, some 600 Nobel Prizes have been awarded in following this reductionist paradigm in the last 120 years. But can reductionism answer the following question? If I give you the property of a single neuron, which we know very well, and a dozen Nobel Prizes have been awarded, Individual neuron is not self-aware, but you hook up 100 billion of them in a particular way, and that we are, it's, it's about 80 billion we have inside our skull. Suddenly the whole thing is self-aware. How does that happen? How do you go from neuron to brain to mind? How do you go from parts level property to the system level of behavior? Now, reductionism cannot answer this because there's nothing left to reduce. You're not taking things apart anymore. You're actually putting things together. It's an entirely different way of thinking about uh, this uh, problem. And so this reminded me of a talk that Lord Kelvin of the thermodynamics fame, I mean, as Stratus said, I have an affinity for statistical thermodynamics. And so I keep going back to that. That's my go-to place. And so Lord Kelvin gave this interesting talk at the Royal Institution, which uh, Stratos knows very well, it's on Albemarle Street uh, near Piccadilly, and uh, that's the one. And then this lecture theater is still there. Uh, where is April of 1900, just dawn of the 20th century. 
The title was 19th Century Clouds Over the Dynamic Theory of Heat and Light, where Kelvin says, and this is an exact quote, he's looking at that audience and he's telling them, folks, physics knowledge is almost complete. April of 1900. Okay, so he says pretty much everything we need to know about the universe, folks, so we, we know. But Kelvin being Kelvin, he knew that it's still some trouble brewing in the horizon. He said there are two small clouds that remain over the horizon. Kelvin recognized that not all is well, but he also underestimated uh, you know, these clouds because he said there were two small clouds. And it turned out those two small clouds revolutionized 20th century physics and chemistry and everything else. One was the black body radiation problem. Around the same time when Kel uh, Kelvin was talking, same year, within months, Max Planck published his quantum hypothesis, and that was the birth of quantum mechanics. This was one cloud. The other cloud is the negative result of the michelson morley experiment, which gave birth to special relativity in 1905 and general relativity in 1915. So in a similar way, I believe not two clouds, there's one large cloud out there. It's not a small cloud either, it's a large cloud, which is this question. How do you go from parts to whole? How do you go from neuron to brain to mind? Okay, here, reductionism won't help you. You need a constructionist theory. It's an entirely different way of, this is actually synthesis. The other one was taking things apart, that's analysis. Now, it's a different paradigm. So we need an entirely new science about these class of problems. And it requires a new conceptual synthesis across AI, systems engineering, statistical mechanics, game theory, and biology. Because of all the people, only engineers putting, put things together. See, everybody else, mathematicians, physicists, science, you know, chemists, biologists, they take things apart. Only engineers put things together, particularly systems engineers are the ones. So that's why I have systems engineering here to understand this question we really need to think about bringing ideas from systems engineering as well. So what might such a theory look like? So this is a question I've been thinking about on the side from 1982, from my graduate school days uh, with Kate Govins for that. Well, from going from individual agents to uh, emergent properties of millions of agents, we know how to do this in some cases, such as I, if I know the properties of a molecule, and if I put an Avogadro number of them in, in, a, in, a, in a container, I know that I can predict the properties of the gas, at least for ideal gas like molecules. This is statistical dynamics. This is really a systems engineering discipline because you go from parts to the form. So, my question, that question I asked myself in 1982 was what would StackMate look like? If the agents were not dumb like molecules, when I say dumb, they, you know, they don't have free will, they are prisoners of Newton's laws, they just follow F equals MA at any given instant. But what if the agents are intelligent? That they actually, you know, it's like a gas molecule goes and bumps against the container wall and says, oh, that part, I'm not doing it again. People would do that, molecules don't. So what would StackMate look like? And, and these agents would be neurons. And because my question, my interest was, how do you go from neuron to brain to mind? And then robots and people and so on. So can we generalize statistical thermodynamics? So it took me some time, took me some 30 years. And then, yes, it can be. And the new discipline, I call it uh, statistical thermodynamics. Telos, as Stratos knows very well in Greek, it means gold. In thermodynamics, molecules change states driven by thermal agitation. In teleodynamics, agents switch states driven by goals because, you know, like you want to graduate and go make more money and, you know, make, uh, do a better quality of life, this and that, you know. So we are driven by these desires of uh, various goals and this, this drives our dynamics. And so, so basically I developed this in order to do this uh, neuron to brain uh, business, but I ended up ending up in economics. So the mathematics took me, without me realizing it, that the parts to system theory I was developing took me to economics, not neuroscience. Okay, but it ended up answering a different and equally interesting uh, question. It's a constructionist theory of the emergence of income distribution. 
And it answered this 200 year old open question. It's been there since the days of Adam Smith and Wealth of Nations, which is how much inequality is fair. It was completely unexpected for me. And, and the math and the conceptual framework actually guided me more than me guiding uh, its uh, development. And it's really a synthesis by bringing in ideas from political philosophy, economics, with game theory, stat, stat make information theory, and systems uh, engineering. So, so this is how now I'm viewing this entire space. At one end, we have purpose-free molecules and agents of that nature, and that is statistical thermodynamics. And the, 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 it is described by uh, statistical equilibrium. The other extreme, your purpose-driven agents, and this is where people, rational, uh, you know, homo economicus model, for example. Yeah. And this is where statistical paleodynamics is. And it turns out I showed that uh, they, they reach a different equilibrium, what's called arbitrage equilibrium. That's a game theory equilibrium. And these two are actually equivalent under certain uh, conditions. So what I am after now are the ones in between now. So you can think of this as molecules with 0% agency. They have no control over their future. These are these highly irrational individuals with complete control over the future, at least under the ideal cases. And then there are possibly agents with varying degrees of this agency in between. And one example is actually birds flying around and flocking and, and so on. This is the subject of what people call now as active matter. Uh, so I won't get into the details of this. It turns out statistical dynamics actually can explain how birds and, and fish swim together and you know what happens there or bacteria uh which uh are you know in chemotaxis when they are going after food or how ants build craters turns out all these things are they have different levels of agencies and they are in there and they are all part of this theory which goes from active matter to passive matter to active matter so to summarize uh I view AI in this context as, uh, you know, it's a knowledge modeling paradigm. And there have been, you know, a couple of paradigms in the past. The first one in chemical engineering was for a long time, chemistry was a heuristic discipline. You know, you just did things, seats of the hand approach kind of thing. That all changed through the work of Neil Amundsen, who was an applied mathematician, but professor of chemical engineering at Minnesota. He and his students, basically brought in ideas from applied mathematics into chemical engineering, mainly linear algebra and ODE and BDE techniques to model first principles knowledge uh, and process unit behavior, CSTRs, distillation columns, and you know, tubular reactors and whatnot. And that all happened in the 50s. So this is the first wave of knowledge modeling in chemical engineering. Then the second wave came through the work of um, uh, Stratus's um, former colleague, uh, Professor Raja Sargent at Imperial, who brought in ideas from operations research uh, and made, made formal models of the decision making, which used to be heuristic. Now it's all well defined using ideas from MILP, MANLP, and so on. In a similar way, I argue that artificial intelligence is the third paradigm for modeling knowledge in chemical engineering. And it didn't start five years ago or 10 years ago. It really started in the 80s through the work of Art Westerberg and George Stephanopoulos and others from that era. And I, the new thing here is how do you model, model symbolic structure? That is what is behind the taxonomy. That is what is behind uh, all these ontologies and so on. Now. And so the challenges and opportunities are, as I said, there are these easy problems. Don't worry about them focus on the hard and harder ones, which is hybrid AI, causal models based AI, building these kind of ontologies, languages and compilers. And I think this will take another 10 to 15 years to do them routinely. But to me, the really, really exciting problem is the science of this, uh, emergent behavior, you know, which is how do you, what is the theory of design control optimization through self-organization? We all do all three. But if, when a flow sheet is designed, a bunch of guys sit around the table and say, well, well let's put this, we need a reaction, we need a separation system, this goes there, that goes here, but you need a controller. Nothing like that goes on inside the human body when a baby is conceived. There is nothing inside telling the, uh, you know, whatever that's going to make sure both eyes go on either side of the nose, not on the same side as the Picasso painting. 
How does this happen? To me, every normally born baby is a miracle. You know, and, and, and that woman should be made a saint because this, this is, uh, as a design and control engineer, I'm just amazed. There are a million things can go wrong, but they don't typically. It's actually, you know, the, the babies which are not born normally are actually exceptions and proof. To me, this is absolutely phenomenal. So what is the science behind it? What is the theory behind it? We understand BSC from the top down. This is the bottom up perspective. This is an entirely different way of thinking about it. So that's basically what I'm after here. And so, and related to that is this question, what is the mathematical theory of consciousness? And to me, this is the most important scientific question of the 21st century. And it would require actually synthesis, bringing in ideas from all, all these things. And so it turns out entropy is key in understanding this. Now, entropy has always been a bit of a mysterious and a kind of a you know, nebulous concept and often misunderstood. Even the giants seem to have missed it. For example, Carnot was you know, father of thermodynamics. Uh, he suspected, he didn't know about entropy. He knew something else was needed. Uh, he knew about conservation of energy, but he didn't know about entropy. But he knew something was missing, but he didn't know what. And that was identified by Clausius. The German physicist who gave the name entropy and gave us the formula ds equals dq by t and and he said thermodynamic systems evolve in such a way that the entropy increases so even Carnot didn't i mean clausius did not understand it uh, because it was gibbs who said not only entropy increases it actually reaches a maximum but even the great gibbs did not understand entropy completely because it was left to boltzmann to see the connection between entropy and the molecular stage and, and discovered the famous formula S equals K log W, which is inscribed on his tomb in Vienna. Okay, but those guys saw uh, entropy as a measure of disorder and systems increase, uh, go in a way of maximizing disorder and all that. But even the even Boltzmann did not understand entropy that well because he saw it as a thermodynamic concept, but it was rediscovered by Claude Shannon in the 1940s when he was at Bell Labs, later on at MIT, uh, as the father of information theory, he saw that this is the unit, this is a measurement of uncertainty in information, okay? But even Shannon did not understand entropy as it turns out because it was left to James, who was a professor of physics at WashU, who saw the connection between the information theoretic entropy and the statistical thermodynamics. Uh, but I would argue that even James missed something because he missed this idea that entropy is a measure of fairness in a distribution, which you need in order to be able to apply entropic ideas to economics and sociology. So that is my contribution uh, in the scheme of things is that to recognize that entropy really is a measure of fairness, which in thermodynamics turns out to be disorder and in information theory turns out to be uncertainty. Those are context dependent interpretation, but underlying all that is this requirement that, you know, it, it, you know different uh, competing hypotheses need to be treated with equal probabilities if you don't know anything else about them. So that's basically a condition of uh, fairness. But now, so essentially entropy is sort of like this proverbial uh, uh, elephant and the blind man tale of uh, Hinduism. In Hindu philosophy, we use this to, you know, to describe the concept of God, that you see in through your senses different facets of this, you know, like uh, this, uh, you know, blind man feels the trunk and feels it like a tube, and this person feels it, you know, elephant is like a pillar, but elephant has those properties, but it is more. So entropy has the property of disorder, has the property of insanity, but it's, it's actually uh, much more. And so now the question I've been thinking about for the last 10 years is what, what does entropy mean for cognitive systems? Because I'm still interested in the question of neuron to brain. And so what, what, is that, what does it mean for cognitive systems? We know what it means in physics. We know what it means in economic and sociology. What about cognitive science? And so uh, this reminded me of another quote, and I'll end with this. Wolfgang Pauli said this 100 years ago about quantum mechanics. And it is absolutely relevant to our present discussion. So Pauli said, the best we can hope to achieve in physics is simply misunderstand at a deeper level. So it's such a beautiful and insightful uh, remark that uh, 
you know, you only, you're gaining deeper understanding, but you're still misunderstanding it because there's something else beneath that. And so entropy has taught us certainly that we understood it as disorder for then uncertainty, now fairness, maybe there's something more. So let me stop here and uh, thank all my uh, funding sources and various uh, past students and postdocs and collaborators. And uh, the, some of the images I've taken are from the various sources on the internet. And again, thanks again for the invitation and thank you for your patience and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. So.